welcome you all and um, to start off the uh, uh, ECG update, um, the topic for, uh, for the next one hour or so is going to be one of the uncommon um, uh, rhythm disorders that you may see in medical practice that is uh, yeah, white QRS tachycardia or uh, broad QRS tachycardia. Uh, it is, although it is not so common, but uh, this has disastrous uh, consequences. So a QIC analysis and um, uh, a QIC uh, therapeutic decision has to be implemented. And uh, as with my Carl infarction, time is life here in this scenario. And the earlier you act, uh, the higher chance of uh, your patient surviving this uh, uncommon rhythm disorder. So. Uh, uh, this would be my format, so I would um, uh, uh, get the problem defined for you. We will discuss the common differentials that should come to your mind when you see this kind of uh, rhythm strip. We'll have a brief look at what is the mechanism of this kind of rhythm uh, disorders um, and how to get about them uh, uh, not only based on the ECG analysis, but also a quick look at the, uh, a quick look at the history, uh, what are the rapid things you need to look on physical examination. And uh, just uh, before concluding, we'll also have a look at the common ECG algorithms that are available on uh, deciphering uh, white QRS tachycardias. So to set the ball rolling, we need to understand um, what uh, defines a white QRS tachycardia. So, as, um, yeah. So, uh, white QRS tachycardia, as the nomenclature itself is self explanatory. White QRS means a QRS duration, which is more than 120 milliseconds. And tachycardia, as you all know, is by definition any, any rhythm disorder with a rate which is more than 100 beats per minute. So white QRS tachycardia means nothing but a rhythm with a rate which is more than 100 beats per minute and a QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds. The two most common differential is simply ventricular tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia with aberrance. By definition, ventricular tachycardia means three or more consecutive ventricular beats, that means white QRS beats, with a rate which is more than 100 beats per minute. Electrophysiological perspective of uh, you want an objective uh, way of differentiating supraventricular tachycardia from ventricular tachycardia, the differentiating line or the Lakshman Rekha is actually the bundle of his. Any rhythm disorder which originates below the bundle of his is ventricular tachycardia and any rhythm disorder with originating focus above bundle of his is by definition or from an electrophysiologic perspective is a supraventricular tachycardia. So whenever you see a patient with white QRS tachycardia, the first thing you need to look at is whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. You just look at the RR variability. So if the RR variability, uh, that is the RR between the largest and smaller, uh, the, la the largest and smallest is actually less than 120 milliseconds, it, it's a regular uh, white QRS tachycardia. And if it is regular white QRS tachycardia, again, uh, the, the three differentials you should keep in your mind is ventricular tachycardia, which is the most common etiology. The other differentials are supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy or antidromic tachycardia or pathway mediated tachycardia. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you are dealing with uh, irregular white QRS tachycardia, the common differentials are either it's a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or it's an atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter pre-existing bundle branch block or an atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter conducting down an accessory pathway, what we call as a pre-excited atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia. In view of the as a shortage of time, I'll be sticking on to the approach towards a regular white QRS tachycardia, although I'll be also giving you some glimpses of some case scenarios where we see irregular white QRS tachycardia as well. But the focus of today's talk would be on regular white QRS tachycardia, which is a much more common clinical problem you see in practice. 
essentially people in the emergency department are going to see it more or people dealing with uh, critically ill patients are going to see them more. Statistically, you all know that common things come first. So a patient comes to you with regular white crest tachycardia. Etiology wise, most prevalent disorder presenting with this kind of an uh, uh, kind of a ECG strip is going to be ventricular tachycardia. So if you label a uh, regular white crest tachycardia as ventricular tachycardia, you're going to be right in 70 to 80 percent of time. The other common uh, etiology is supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. But you should realize that of all the white crest tachycardia, as you see, SVT with aberrancy constitutes about just 20 percent. So one out of five patients with white crest tachycardia is only going to have SVT with aberrancy. Although theoretically, we discuss a lot about pre-excited tachycardias or antitromic tachycardia, pathway mediated tachycardia, ventricular pace to them as, uh, as presenting as white crest tachycardia. But you should realize that although they are of more academic interest, but in practice, they just constitute 5% of all the white crest tachycardias you're going to see in clinical practice. So, when, so fancy things kept to be la kept uh, uh, lower down in the list of uh, differentials. Before diagnosing uh, antitromic tachycardia as a cause of a white crest tachycardia in your patient, remember that only one out of 20 patients coming to you with a white crest tachycardia is going to have uh, antitromic tachycardia or pathway mediated tachycardia. It's just so uncommon. So th this is taking you back to your physiology classes. This is the native conduction system on one side and the conduction velocity is depicted on the right hand side. So this clearly elucidates why in a normal sinus rhythm you have a narrow sleep QRS. In a normal sinus rhythm, if you look at the picture on the right, I hope you can see my pointer. The ventricular activation happens from the bundle of his into the right bundle and left bundle and then through the Hispokinji system into both the ventricles simultaneously. So there's simultaneous activation of right ventricle and left ventricle from the interventricular septum through a very rapidly conducting conduction system, rapidly conducting fibers, what we call the bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers. You can see the bundle branches conduct at a speed of two meter per second, Purkinje fibers conduct at a speed of four meter per second. On the other hand, just note that the ventricular muscle conducts at a speed of 0.5 meter per second. So this is just one eighth of the speed of the Purkinje fibers or 25% of the speed of the bundle branches. And this will make you understand why a person, when he comes to you with this kind of rhythm, he has a white QRS. So as I said, a person comes to you with a white QRS tachycardia, 80% of the time, the, uh, the etiology is going to be ventricular tachycardia. 70 to 80% of the time, the etiology is simply going to be ventricular tachycardia. So ventricular tachycardia originates from, the vent from either of the ventricles. So it is originating from a myocyte and the impulse transmits from one myocyte to another myocyte. So there is myocardial transmission of impulse. You, will, you had seen in the earlier slide that the myocardial impulse transmission happens at just about 0.5 meter per second. And then there is sequential activation of ventricle. So if a VT originates from ven left ventricle, it depolarizes the entire left ventricle first and then the right ventricle. So there is myocardium to myocardial transmission of impulse and there is sequential activation of one ventricle followed by the other ventricle. This explains why a ventricular tachycardia results in a wide QRS rhythm. On the other hand, the second most common differential, as I said, in about 20% of cases, you might have a supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. So that means you the or, impulse originates, sorry, the impulse originates from above the his bundle, but conducts to the ventricle through either a disease conduction system which is pre-existingly diseased or there is a rate prolongation of conduction which delays the conduction and uh, so there's still, a, uh, still uh, uh, con a conduction happening on the conduction system but since it is diseased or there is a physiologic uh, conduction delay in this uh, Hispokinji system or the conduction system, there is a white QRS happening. Again, if the person has a right bundle branch block, the left ventricles get activated first and then subsequently the right ventricle gets activated. So there is sequential activation of ventricle, which again explains other mechanism of having a broad QRS rhythm. The third mechanism, as I said, the uncommon mechanism is a pathway mediated so in people with um, wolf parkinson white syndrome or uh, a person who has an accessory pathway uh, atrioventricular pathway which connects 
can see this pathway connects the atrium to ventricle. So the ventricular activation first happens at the site of insertion of the, uh, of the pathway. And from that side, there is, as with the ventricular tachycardia, a myocardium to myocardial transmission of impulse. And there is a sequential activation of one ventricle followed by the other ventricle. So that explains why uh, a pathway mediated tachycardia or an antitromic tachycardia has a wide QRS. Now, for people who don't want to go into the complex algorithms or the complex nuances of the ECG, if a person comes to you with a regular wide QRS rhythm, if you don't want to look at all the algorithms or you don't want to look at all the um, uh, intricacies of the white QRS rhythm approach, or if the patient is unstable, like the patient is in pulmonary edema, he has a low blood pressure, he has had a syncope, or he's having severe anchina. In those cases, you don't waste time on ascertaining the, uh, uh, the, the correct mechanism of white QRS tachycardia. The simplest approach is to just presume that all white QRS tachycardias are ventricular tachycardia. Just because if you do that, 80% of the time, you are going to be correct. If you want to improve your positive predictive value, then just take one minute and take a history of prior myocardial infarction or history of LV dysfunction or see whether the patient has a structurally abnormal heart. Just go rapidly through his old records. If he has suffered a myocardial infarction in the past, whether he has a document which says that he has a scar in the myocardium, whether he has LV dysfunction in a, pre, in a, uh, in a echo which was done earlier, or if he's a post uh, coronary bypass surgery with an established myocardial disease, or like he has a, uh, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a structurally abnormal heart. So if he has a prior myocardial infarction, a history of LV dysfunction or a structurally abnormal heart, simply diagnose a, uh, any white QRS tachycardia in such a substrate to be ventricular tachycardia because you are going to be correct in 98% of the time. So your positive predictive value in the presence of these two important history, history is 98%. You need to take, in an unstable patient, you need to quickly diagnose them as VT because ventricular tachycardia, as you know, can be life-threatening. Even if you wrongly diagnose supraventricular tachycardia as ventricular tachycardia, it is really safe because majority of the therapies that you employ for ventricular tachycardia is really safe in supraventricular tachycardia. On the contrary, if you make a diagnosis of supraventricular tachycardia erroneously and you use agents like adenosine, sometimes they can be fatal in patients with ventricular tachycardia. The, es the essential importance of the precise diagnosis actually comes in the long-term prognosis. But all said and done, if you have a positive predictive value of 98% with just uh, a history of myocardial infarction and LV dysfunction, then why do we do this entire talk and entire exercise of uh, ascertaining the mechanism of white QRS tachycardia? This is because the long-term prognosis really differs. And you need to understand that 20% of the time, you can have supraventricular tachycardia masquerading as a white QRS tachycardia. And so you need to understand these patients well. So why does a supraventricular tachycardia present with white QRS rhythm? See, as I said, it can happen because if the patient has a pre-existing bundle branch block or if there is a rate dependent aberrancy, you can have a white QRS rhythm. The other mechanism is if the patient has, is on some sodium channel blocker, like a class 1A or class 1C agent, or if the patient has some electrolyte disturbances like hyperkalemia, which broadens the QRS, in such a scenario also, any supraventricular tachycardia getting conducted down can have a white QRS rhythm. The third mechanism, as I said, is via an accessory pathway. So here, as I said, the accessory pathway connects the atrium to ventricle. And any person who has an antiquately conducting accessory pathway will have a short PR interval because the ventricle is excited before the AV nodal depolarization or AV nodal hysperkinic system mediated depolarization of ventricle, which we call ventricular pre excitation, which is seen on the surface EKG as a short PR interval. So the ventricle get depolarized very early. So the QRS onset is much earlier. So you have a short PR interval. You have a initial ventricular depolarization, which happens from myocardium to myocardium. So there's a slow conduction of impulse which gives you a slurred upstroke of the QRS, which we call the delta wave. And since the ventricular activation is actually a fusion activation, 
between the transmission via the accessory pathway and the native conduction system. There is a white QRS which happens because there is myocardial to myocardial transmission of impulse. And that is why you have this triad of WPW syndrome, which we call, which we, which we denote as a short PR interval, uh, a slurred up stroke of the QRS, which we call the delta wave and white QRS. So a short PR interval, a delta wave and white QRS constitutes the triad of what we call as Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome pattern. And if these patients are symptomatic, we call them Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So patients with this kind of accessory pathway conducting the atrium ventricle, if they have a supraventricular tachycardia, like an atrial tachycardia, the atrial tachycardia or atrial fibrillation can conduct via the accessory pathway now and can result in a white QRS, which is one example, which is one cause for a white QRS tachycardia. On the other hand, they can have a, a impulse which gets transmitted down the accessory pathway. Sorry, it can get conducted down the accessory pathway and can go retrograde via the hispoking system and AV node back to the atrium and can set up a macro reentrant circuit between the atrium, the accessory pathway, ventricle, and the native conduction system, and thereby create what we call as an antitromic tachycardia, which also will result in a white virus tachycardia because the ventricle is depolarized over the accessory pathway and so is going to have this slurred up stroke and broad QRS rhythm. Rarely you can have an anti-grade conduction of one pathway and retrograde conduction of other pathway, which we call a duodromic, duodromic uh, AVRP, which is very, very uncommon. And I would try to keep it away from, this, uh, from, the, uh, from the current uh, discussion because it, it is really uncommon. Sometimes you might uh, see this kind of rhythm. If you see this, this is again a broad QRS tachycardia, but does not come into any of the differentials that we discussed earlier. If you can see here, you can actually see a spike at the onset of QRS. This is nothing but a pacing spike, and this person has a pacemaker which is implanted. As you all know that the pacemaker depolarizes the ventricle, uh, ventricle myocardium directly and could result in a paced beat, which is a broad QRS rhythm. And so any pacemaker-mediated tachycardia is going to have a broad QRS rhythm. This is another example of a very uh, broad QRS tachycardia. Simply looking at this uh, would give us a rapid assumption that this is simply ventricular tachycardia because of the broadness of the QRS. But if you look at the history of this patient, this patient had a past history of atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation and was put on flicanate. Flicanate, uh, as you all know, is a class one uh, sodium channel blocking agent. And since it's a sodium channel blocking agent, it results in a broad QRS rhythm. And when the, uh, when the supraventricular tachycardia gets conducted down, or in presence of a sodium channel block like quicklime, you can have an SVT, which can result in a broad QRS tachycardia. This is again the uh, antitromic tachycardia, which I was alluding to earlier. This patient has a uh, baseline evidence of pre excitation in the form of a short PR. You can see lead B1, lead AVF, lead 2, lead 3, which all show a short PR interval, a slurred up stroke of the QRS, which you see well on the body leads as well and a white QRS, which indicates that there's an anti conducting accessory pathway. And when this uh, impulse gets transmitted purely by the accessory pathway, anti and retrogradely via the native conduction system, it sets up what I said earlier, the antitromic tachycardia. And here, you can see that the, the QRS looks, the onset would look, look just the same as the sinus rhythm, but the broadness increases because the entire ventricle is depolarized via the accessory pathway. And you can have a maximally pre-excited ventricular depolarization in a person with an accessory pathway, antitrobic tachycardia. Similarly, if it is conducted via one accessory pathway down, another accessory pathway up, you call it duodropic tachycardia. This is another person who had an uh, accessory pathway. Here, the person had an atrial flutter. So in atrial flutter, you know that the atrial impulse happens at a rate of 250 beats per minute. And so, Plus an accessory pathway, it can conduct rapidly down this accessory pathway and can result in a rapid or very fast broad QRS tachycardia, which is nothing but a pre-excited atrial flutter. It's nothing but atrial flutter, which is conducted down via the accessory pathway to the ventricle and results in a broad QRS. 
this is one ecg i don't want you any one of you to forget because this is a, a sure catastrophe or a sure time bomb if you if a if a person comes to you with this ecg never waste time in understanding the mechanism the simplest way to look at this ecg is it is very really fast it will be happening at somewhere rate right between 300 uh, 250 to 300 it is going to be very fast the cure is really going to be broad and it is going to be irregularly irregular this is nothing but be excited if it and is a very common cause of sudden cardiac death in individuals with access hypoxia so when you see a fast broad irregularly irregular rhythm it's always a pre excited if the evidence of accessory pathway as you all know is seen in the evidence of slurred up stroke of the qrs you can see in b4 b5 and all you have a slurred up stroke of the qrs and it's an atrial fibrillation because it is irregularly irregular the actual qrs morphology changes from b to b indicating that there is a, a, a competition between the native conduct system and the accessory pathway in, in what impulse is getting transmitted to the ventricle and that is why contrary to af with aberrancy where in which the qrs morphology do not vary from b to b much but in pre excited af there is a lot of inter qrs variability in the same ecg now this is another ecg which has fooled um, many of our intensivists many of our critical care nurses you see these kind of ecgs the lower panel ecgs you can see you see these kind of ecgs in the icu telemetry uh, you see these things in patients who have been monitored with uh, defibrillators in the room on the on your telemetry screen and when you rapidly run to this patient and look at him the patient despite this kind of crazy ecg is the patient is very comfortable you look at the saturation probe it is showing a, a regular rhythm patient is hemodynamically stable patient looks quite dissociated with this kind of ecg so this is nothing but an artifact the clue to this is look at this high frequency signal tracings which indicate the native depolarization in uh, in different leads so these are the high frequency signals within the the high frequency signals have been marked with arrows which indicate the native sinus speech or native depolarization it would indicate that these artifacts and not really white cure tachycardia or the polymorphic bt for which many of the patients have received shocks now you approach to white cure tachycardia as i said always look at history and physical examination look for evidence of uh, um as i said evidence of structural heart disease or history of prior myocardial infarction history of lv dysfunction or prior history of myocardial infarction or lv dysfunction would easily make a diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia with a positive predictive value somewhere between 95 to 98% on the other hand a young patient with history of recurrent episodes of tachycardia for 3 or more years it is more likely to be a supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy when you do the simplest calculation of just looking at the history alone in the presence of structural heart disease or myocardial infarction this paper by masood after clearly says that irrespective of what you see on ecg if the person has structural heart disease or history of prior myocardial infarction you are going to have any white cure tachycardia coming to you has vt in 95% of patients and if there is a prior history of myocardial infarction every white cure tachycardia is going to be a vt except in 2% of cases so 98% of the time a person with prior myocardial infarction or white cure tachycardia is going to be weak now these are the physical examination findings that you need to look at these are only for astute clinicians nowadays nobody is going to spend time looking at the neck in a person with a white cure tachycardia but the essential clinical examination details that you need to look out for is evidence of hemodynamic uh, evidence of uh, av dissociation that is a cannon wave which you can see here on the on the neck in both of these patients is cannon waves actually indicates av dissociation and is a sure shot sign of the rhythm being a white cure tachycardia one other thing important take home message that you need to take or uh, take out of this lecture is that hemodynamic stability of a rhythm does not indicate supraventricular tachycardia or a benign disease hemodynamic stability has nothing to do with a diagnosis of vt or svt the other thing you need to understand is any av nodal blocking maneuvers like wall salva carotid sinus massage if it is able to terminate a white cure tachycardia it strongly suggests that it is a supraventricular tachycardia although it can rarely happen with ventricular tachycardias as well 
Now, suppose you are doing an echocardiogram and you see that the patient suddenly goes in for a bronchiolar tachycardia or a, or a tachycardia. You don't have time to shift them to the ECG and uh, take a ECG, ECG strip and see what is happening. The simplest way in these scenarios, if you're doing an echocardiogram and patient goes in for a tachycardia, simply put an MO cursor on the parasternal long axial view where you can get a ventricular cut as well as the atrial cut. This is the LV outflow as well as this is the left atrial uh, on the lower part. So you can see the atrial contraction. The lower panel shows the LA contraction. And the upper panel shows the right ventricular contraction. You can see in this rhythm, clearly the ventricular contractions are more than the atrial contraction, indicating that this is AV dissociation, more Vs than more As, and it, it, it simply indicates that the patient has ventricular tachycardia. Now, pharmacological agents which come, in ha come handy are any AV nodal blocking agents like adenosine, diltiasm, verapamil, digoxin. Termination of a bicurus tachycardia with these AV nodal agents in most of the time would indicate ventricular tachycardia. This is not a 100% rule or because you can have ventricular tachycardias which terminate with verapamil or uh, rarely ventricular tachycardias which terminate with diltiasm or adenosine. But majority of the time, if you have a bicurus tachycardia and it terminates easily and reproducibly with AV nodal blocking agents like adenosine, it usually indicates that it is supraventricular tachycardia. While, on the other hand, termination with amiodron, any, uh, any white curus tachycardia terminate, if it terminates with amiodron, it does not help in differentiating supraventricular tachycardia versus ventricular tachycardia. Now, if you have the luxury of getting his baseline ECG, like if the patient is in a stable white curus tachycardia, and you want to clearly understand the diagnosis before you jump into the treatment part, look at his baseline ECG. Any evidence of structural heart disease, like evidence of ischemia on the old ECG, evidence of old myocardial infarction, presence of Brugada syndrome, presence of these epsilon waves. These are epsilon waves, which you can see. These are nothing but you can see the terminal part of the QRS, a slur in the, in the anterior precordial leads, V1 to V3, have a slur in the terminal part of the QRS, what we call as a, the post excitation, just synonymous to the pre excitation that we see in pathway here is a post-excitation or slurred upstroke of the QRS, which indicates a slow conduction in the right ventricle, what we call as the epsilon wave, and is very pathognomonic of arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, although it is seen only in 30% of cases with arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia. Similarly, a slur slurring in the QRS, which we call the fragmented QRS, evidence of, uh, of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, suggestive of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, all these things. Evidence of structural heart disease always indicate that the, the patient has, uh, has a wide QRS tachycardia due to ventricular tachycardia. Now, this is another ECG of a person which, who came with a wide QRS tachycardia. Looking at the ECG, ECG, you might get confused, but things become very easy when you look at the baseline ECG. You see that the baseline ECG person has a similar broad QRS uh, pattern, and uh, the tachycardia here is clearly SVT with pre existing bundle branch block because the, the baseline ECG itself shows a similar QRS and axis. So, whenever you are, you are dealing with a wide QRS tachycardia, Simplest approach is look at the QRS. If your QRS is very compatible with a typical bundle branch block pattern you are aware of, like a left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block, invariably this is supraventricular tachycardia apparency. On the other hand, there are some very reliable criteria to differentiate uh, VT from SVT with apparency. They are AV dissociation, fusion beats, capture beats, the QRS duration, axis, the concordance. And so those things I'll be alluding to for the second part of my talk. So beginning off with the most specific sign to differentiate uh, ventricular tachycardia from supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy, it is AV dissociation. So look at the lead one in this. You can see that the atrial depolarization as evidenced by the V wave here and the ventricular depolarization as evidenced by the QRS here in lead V1 and lead V1 is very clear. You can see that the V waves and QRS are totally divorced, actually. They don't talk to each other. They are not connected at all. They are totally dissociated. This is what we call AV dissociation, again alluded to in this ECG. You can see the lead two here. The P waves walk totally are dissociated from the QRS, what we call again as AV dissociation. And it is a very, very specific criteria for VT with a specificity close to 100%. 
But the unfortunate thing is that AV dissociation happens only in 20 to 50 percent of all ventricular tachycardias, and very, very rarely supraventricular tachycardias can have AV dissociation, although clinically not seen. One clue to the presence of AV dissociation is variation in the QRS amplitude. If you look at the lead P here, you can see that the terminal part of QRS has some variation, subtle changes, which indicate the presence of the E wave or the atrial depolarization, and that is an indirect evidence of AV dissociation. The subtle changes in the QRS amplitude indicate the presence of AV dissociation. You can also see in lead to this uh, strip B here again, uh, these things indicate AV dissociation. But you should realize that 30% of ventricular tachycardias can have one-to-one -one retrograde VA conduction, and in those cases, AV dissociation is not seen. And AV dissociation can also be unmasked by carotid sinus massage or AV nodal blocking agents like adenosine. Now, if you see this kind of ECG, look at what is the rhythm. You might be confused. It is a broad QRS tachycardia. It could be ventricular tachycardia or SVT aberrancy. Sometimes in these scenarios, one thing which really comes in handy is the Lewis state. What you do for Lewis state is nothing but the RA, right arm electrode is placed on the second right intercostal space adjusted in the sternum, and the left arm electrode, you can see as in the picture, is placed on the fourth right intercostal space close to sternum. And the strip which is recorded between this right arm and left arm is called the Lewis lead between the second right intercostal space and the fourth right intercostal space. And when you have Lewis lead, it clearly depicts atrial depolarization better and in the same rhythm you can clearly see P waves well dissociated ventricles. You can see P waves here, you can see P waves here, you can see P waves here. So AV dissociation is unmasked by the Lewis lead and it clearly helps us in making a diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia. Now other features which are very specific for AV dissociation is see that uh, they are called fusion beats and capture beats. So this is a person who has a ventricular tachycardia. He has ventricle which is getting depolarized from the ectopic focus inside the left ventricle. He also continues to have sinus depolarization based on the rates and mutual combination between these two competing rhythms. Sometimes during the ventricular tachycardia, the native sinus depolarization can be transmitted via the Hispokinji system and can depolarize the entire ventricle which we call the capture beat. So capture beat will have, will begin off with a P wave, would have a QRS which is just similar to the, to the native sinus QRS or sinus rhythm QRS and, and this is what we call capture beat because this clearly indicates a feature of AV dissociation, the atrium and ventricle are dissociated. Sometimes the ventricle on the other hand can have a depolarization which is Sorry, sometimes a ventricle can have partially get depolarized from the ventricular ectopic focus and partially get depolarized from the native sinus uh, impulse. And so that is what we call a fusion beat. So this is a fusion beat. Fusion beat, the QRS would be somewhere between the capture beat or between the sinus QRS and between the ventricular tachycardia QRS. So it will be a, a mixture of the ventricular tachycardia QRS and sinus QRS, and that's what we call the fusion beat. So this is a, a, a rhythm strip of a person having having a broad QRS tachycardia. This is the broad QRS tachycardia. You can see a P wave here, followed by a QRS, which is just not similar to the, the first beat. That is the first beat of ventricular tachycardia, and the second beat is actually slightly different. So the second beat is slightly narrower, and there's a preceding P wave, which is nothing but a fusion beat. As you move forward, you can see another beat P wave here. And the next QRS after the P wave or the fourth beat in this strip has a QRS which is really narrow. It is nothing but a capture beat. And it is because of the ventricular, ventricular capture by the native sinus depolarization. And uh, as you subsequently see in the rhythm strip, you can clearly see P waves totally dissociated from the QRS indicating AV dissociation. So you have AV dissociation, fusion beats, capture beat, all in the same strip. Again, on the E2 baseline uh, rhythm strip, you can see P waves totally dissociated, indicating AV dissociation. You can see a, a P wave followed by a very narrow B, narrow QRS beat, which is nothing but a capture beat. And you can see some QRSs which are intermediate between the sinus QRS and between the VT morphology of the QRS in fusion beats. All these are very specific for tachycardia. The third thing is QRS axis. 
So, sorry, the third thing, next thing is QRS duration. 70% of ventricular tachycardias have a QRS duration, which is more than 140 milliseconds, while none of your SVTs are going to be so broad. So as I said, look at the earlier uh, ex explanation of the broad QRS rhythm, I said in ventricular tachycardia, as there is myocardial myocardial transmission of impulse and sequential activation of ventricle, the QRS can be as wide as any duration because the myocardial to myocardial transmission of impulse can take longer time if you have really scarred a left ventricle. And um, on the other hand, if you have uh, SVT tuberancy, still some part of ventricle is always depolarized over a fastly, a rapidly conducting his perkinji system or the conduction system. So QRS, even if it is broad, it cannot be broader than a particular level. So if a person has a right bundle branch block, QRS duration of up to 140 milliseconds can happen with SVT debrancy. So in an RBD, if the QRS duration is more than 140 milliseconds, it is clearly VT. For left bundle branch block, in SVT, the QRS duration can go up to 160 milliseconds, but never beyond that. But mind you, when you make these, these assumptions, any antiarrhythmic agent, as I said in the earlier example, if you give a sodium channel blocking agent, antiarrhythmic agents can really broaden the QRS. Similarly, if you have a VT, which is originating from the interventricular septum, or VT, which is originating from the initiative conduction system. So example, a vesicular VT, or, in, or uh, intervesicular VT, or a septal VT. So here, despite it being a ventricular tachycardia, it originates from the septum, the simultaneous activation of both ventricles, and since it enrolls the conduction system very early, they have rapid depolarizations within the ventricle, and so despite being a ventricular tachycardia, the person can have really narrow QRS beats actually on, it's not very narrow QRS by definition, but of compared to all the VTs that you see, these are the, uh, these are the VTs, that is the, the septal VTs and the idiopathic VTs and uh, 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 mediated via the conduct systems, which can have a relatively narrower QRS compared to the myocardial VTs. Now, next coming to the QRS axis. As you all know, the normal axis is between minus 30 to plus 90. Whenever you have a northwest axis, you should always understand that a northwest axis always indicates VT. Whatever kind of aberrancy you have, whatever kind of bundle branch blocks you have, you can never ever change axis so much that it becomes a northwest axis. So that is why whenever you have a northwest axis or a prominent R in AVR, a prominent R in AVR clearly indicates that it's northwest axis. It's a sure short sign that you are dealing with that. If the axis difference between the sinus rhythm and broad QRS rhythm is more than 40 degrees, like if the sinus, uh, in sinus rhythm, the axis is minus 30 and during the tachycardia, the axis is plus 150. If the difference in axis is more than 40 degrees, it always indicates that you're dealing with ventricular tachycardia. Combinations of left bundle branch block with the right axis or right bundle branch block with left axis is always indicative of VT. The next thing you need to remember is the QRS concordance. So suppose you have all the QRS from V1 to V6 being positive. This is what we call positive concordance. And this is very specific for VT or antidromic tachycardia. Suppose you have all the QRS from V1 to V6, all the QRS are negative. That's what we call negative concordance. Negative concordance are always, always very specific for ventricular tachycardia. So concordant pattern, the precordial leads are uncommon with supraventricular tachycardia, only exception being an antitromic tachycardia can have a positive concordance. The specificity of this concordant pattern is clearly close to 90%, but unfortunately, as like with AVD dissociation, is seen only in 20% of VTs. Negative concordance, whenever you say, as shown in this ACG, you have negative concordance across the precordial leads and a positive AVR. Negative concordance is clearly an indicator of northwest axis. That is the depolarization always going from away from the anterior chest precordial leads, indicating an VT which is originating from near the apex. So negative precordance on extreme northwest axis, all these are very, very specific for ventricular tachycardia. As I said, Q, any evidence of structural heart disease. You all know that Q waves indicate an electrical window in the myocardium and Q waves 
even if it is present during sinus rhythm or during white pyrus tachycardia indicate the presence of a scar and in, are in very much in favor of vt see this example this patient had a old myocardial anterior myocardial infarction you can see the native sinus uh, qrs with qs pattern in v1 to v4 even during vt the q waves are repeated so generally a person with ventricular tachycardia on the other right hand panel you have a person who had a old inferior myocardial infarction during vt again the uh, the inferior q waves are repeated so q waves are generally repeated during white qrs tachycardia and so you can still look for evidence of q waves in the white qrs rhythm and when you have q waves in a white qrs rhythm it indicates old myocardial infarction and in such scenarios it is always always going to be ventricular tachycardia unfortunately qr patterns are seen only in 40% of patients in the patients with post myocardial infarction vt you should also remember that dilated cardiomyopathy patients can have q waves in the absence of old myocardial infarction and so similarly in uh, uh, in uh, dilated cardiomyopathy mediated ventricular tachycardia you can have q waves which are only seen during vt and not seen in sinus rhythm rarely pseudo q waves can be seen in uh, in supraarrhythmic tachycardia like avnrt which indicates which is nothing but actually an atrial depolarization falling on the uh, on the qrs or it can be rarely seen in accessory pathway mediated tachycardia now the next pointer is based on qrs duration suppose in the baseline like you see on the left hand strip you have a baseline ecg which shows a white qrs rhythm so baseline itself the person has a white qrs rhythm now if this person during the tachycardia has a narrow qrs tachycardia or a, a qrs which is narrower in tachycardia than in sinus rhythm so person has a baseline white qrs white qrs rhythm during tachycardia the qrs narrows down further this is a sure shot sign that the person has ventricular tachycardia this is because if the person has an aberrant conduction or a, a, a pre existing bundle branch block suppose he has a left bundle branch block any supraventricular tachycardia is going to have a persistent left bundle branch block or the qrs duration will be same or broader than the sinus rhythm qrs but suppose if a person has a left bundle branch block on baseline and if the ventricular tachycardia originates from the left ventricle you are going to have a narrower qrs during tachycardia than in sinus rhythm because the ventricle left ventricle will be activated faster than in a diseased bundle branch now in when in my ventricular tachycardia as i said the initial depolarization is myocardium to myocardium and so the initial depolarization is always going to be slower and this is what we call the intrinsicoid reflection or the initial depolarization of the qrs what we call as intrinsicoid reflection it is ascertained by what we call the pawa criteria where we actually look at the time to the peak of r wave from the onset of qrs to the time to the peak of r wave is measured what we call as the r wave peak time if it is more than 50 milliseconds it is a sure shot indicator that you are dealing with myocardial vt it indicates myocardium to myocardial transmission of impulse and the pawa criteria or r wave r wave peak time more than 50 milliseconds indicates a myocardial vt similarly as a corollary to this you can actually look at distance traveled on the y axis in the initial 40 milliseconds of qrs and the distance traveled on the y axis in the last part of last 40 milliseconds of the qrs and if the v the initial uh, uh, depolarization is slower than the terminal depolarization it is again a very specific criteria for better better keep it this is again uh, the morphology as i said whenever you are dealing with a uh, broad qrs tachycardia look at the qrs morphology in the precordial leads if they are very specific for right bundle branch block like on b1 you have a triphasic complex r s r prime pattern with r prime more than the initial r or on b6 you have a triphasic qrs with the r more than s a deep s wave all these things indicate a typical bundle branch block and whenever you have a typical bundle branch block during a white qrs tachycardia it indicates svt aberrant a typical left bundle branch block by definition has rs or a typical qs pattern in the v1 with the time to the peak of s wave being less than 70 milliseconds the time to the nadir of s wave should be less than 70 milliseconds and in v6 you should have a wide monophasic r with absent q wave this is a typical left bundle branch block pattern 
if you have a white color sticky card, this typical bundle branch plot, plot it always indicates an SPT with aberrancy. On the contrary, in a person with a right bundle branch block morphology tachycardia, if you have a monophasic R in V1, that is only R wave, or if you have a QR pattern, a small Q followed by RR pattern, or if you have a triphasic uh, pattern with a rabbit ear pattern, which we say that the first deflection, that is R is more prominent than R prime. Mind you, in right bundle branch block, typical right bundle branch block, the R prime is more than the R. But in VT, you have always R more prominent than the R prime. You can see this rabbit here versus the typical right bundle branch block on the upper part. So when you have rabbit ear configuration, or on V6, you have an R which is less than S in a right bundle branch block, it always indicates VT. So this is the Ashman phenomenon which happens because of a long shot sequence impinging on the refractory pair of right bundle branch and creating an RBB during a supraarterial tachycardia resulting in a broad QRS. On the other hand, with left bundle branch block, in a, in a, a sinus, in a, in, a, in a normal sinus rhythm or an SV to the aberrancy, you'll never have Q waves in V6 in LBB tachycardia. And you will have a very narrow R wave and a sleek downstroke of QRS in V1 during a typical left bundle branch block or an SVT with aberrancy. On the other hand, in a, in a VT with an LBB pattern, you will have a broad R wave in V1 with a duration more than, or the duration of 0 0.03 seconds. You'll have a slur or notch in the downslope of S wave. You have a uh, time to matter of S wave, which is more than 70 milliseconds, which indicates VT. In V6, you can have evidence of a scar in the form of Q wave in an LBB tachycardia, which indicates that it is a VT. So a person has a RBB morphology tachycardia. If the QRS width is more than 140 milliseconds, if there, if the, if there is a left axis deviation, if on V1, you have a tiny Q followed by a prominent R, or you have a monophasic R or an arabic ear configuration, the first R is more prominent than the R prime, or you have a QS pattern in V6 or an R which is less than S in V6, it indicates that it is weak. On the other hand, if you have an LBB morphology tachycardia and the QRS duration is more than 160 milliseconds, or if there is a right axis deviation, if there's an initial R in V1 which is more than 30 milliseconds, if there is a notch or slur in the downstroke of S wave, or if the time from the onset to the star, to the peak of S wave is more than 70 milliseconds, if there's a Q in V6, all of these things during an LBB tachycardia indicates that it is weak. Normally, in, in, a, in, a, in a SVT with aberrancy, you always have some ECG, some uh, uh, precordial lead which shows an RS pattern. But in VT, you'll never see RS pattern. So absence of RS pattern always indicates that it is VT. Even if there's an RS pattern in VT, the, or from the peak of R to the peak of S, the duration is going to be more than 100 milliseconds. Some patterns in V1, which are very specific for them to be VT, is an RS pattern in V1 or this W pattern in V1. These are very specific for ventricular tachycardia. Now, based on all these uh, the theory that I said, there are many algorithms which are proposed. The two common algorithms which you can follow is the Brugada's algorithm and Verike's algorithm, which has been uh, modified uh, twice. So, the most commonest algorithm that you would see is the Brugada's algorithm, looks, which looks at, as I said, the absence of RS complex in any of the precordial leads. So, absence of RS complex clearly indicate that you are dealing with ventricular tachycardia. If you have an RS complex in any of the precordial lead, from the onset, uh, from the longest R to the uh, R to S interval of more than 100 milliseconds, it indicates that you are dealing with ventricular tachycardia. AV dissociation or the classical criteria for VT present in uh, both uh, in, uh, in any, any of the precordial leads again um, indicate that you are dealing with ventricular tachycardia. So, Brugada's algorithm has a, a, spe a, a specificity of close to 98% and a sensitivity which varies between somewhere between 60 and 90%. This is the Verakis algorithm, on the other hand, which has sometimes an accuracy close to 98 to 100%. Here, they look for AV dissociation first. If you have AV dissociation, an initial Q or initial tiny R in uh, ABR, which is more than 40 milliseconds, these, all these things are very specific for VT. If there's a notch on the downstroke um, uh, of a, pre a predominantly negative uh, ABR or a QRS morphology, unlike bundle branch block, it indicates VT. 
you look at the ratio of the initial uh, deflections, intrinsic or deflection, the terminal deflection, if the intrinsic or deflection is slower, it indicates meeting. So you can look at either of these algorithms, but all said and done, the gold standard for always making a final diagnosis, an EP study, where we put meters inside the heart, electrograms or signals from inside the heart, which we call the electrograms. And during a white plus tachycardia, based on electrograms, if you see ventricular dissociation, that is more Vs than A and A and B totally dissociated, this is a sure short sign that we're dealing with ventricular tachycardia. So essentially to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, out of ECG criteria, the most reliable criteria and easy to apply criteria are looking for AV dissociation, fusion beats, capture beats, the QRS duration of more than 140 milliseconds with RB morphology and more than 160 milliseconds with left bundle branch block, an axis which is northwest axis or an axis which changes more than 40 degrees from the native sinus rhythm, a negative concordance on the precordial leads, presence of Q waves during broad QRS tachycardia or a QRS duration which is narrower during tachycardia than sinus rhythm or specific for VT. So in the casualty, when these patients come to you, look at four things. Whether the patient is conscious or not, whether the patient has antenna, how hemodynamically stable the patient is, and whether the patient is in pulmonary edema. So suppose the patient has come with a syncope, patient has ongoing angina, if patient is hemodynamically unstable or the patient has pulmonary edema, never try to decipher the mechanism of white curious tachycardia, just treat him with defibrillation as fast as possible. And if they are stable, you try to look at the algorithms that you have. As I said, you look at whether it is regular or irregular. If you have irregular and you have really a polymorphic uh, QRS, it is definitely going to be polymorphic VT. If you have a irregularly irregular the white curious tachycardia and the QRS morphology is very similar to a typical bundle branch block, it's an AF with an aberrancy. If it has a slurred onset and a varying morphology of QRS, it is a pre-excited AFib. On the other hand, if you have a regular white curious tachycardia, QRS morphology is typical of a bundle branch block or very similar to that you see in sinus rhythm. You are dealing always with an SVD aberrancy, although rarely a bundle branch BT can present in a similar way. Subsequently, look at the evidence of even dissociation, fusion beats, capture beats. If the ventricular rates are more than atrial rates, it's always indicated for ventricular tachycardia. If none of these things are there, I can look for uh, a, a prominent R in AVR, fusion beats, capture beat, northwest axis, stability of structure of heart disease. All of these things are very specific for BT. So, to conclude, whenever you're dealing with a white curious tachycardia, always try to record a 12 lead ECG if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. In a hemodynamically, I'm sorry, if the hemodynamically unstable patient always defibrillate first. In a hemodynamically stable patient, always try to record a 12 lead ECG. If you're not really clear, based on all the algorithms that we discussed now, it is always wiser to treat every white curious tachycardia as ventricular tachycardia. You should always remember that majority of the clinical white curious tachycardias that you see in clinical practice are VTs always. Any white curious tachycardia in the presence of a structurally abnormal heart, like history of prior myocardial infarction or LB dysfunction, is almost always very specific for VT. Hemodynamic stability does not indicate the diagnosis. So, a VT can be hemodynamically stable, a supraventricular tachycardia can be sometimes hemodynamically unstable. Baseline ECG always gives you a lot of clue, like presence of pre-existing bundle branch block, presence of pre-excitation, presence of structural heart disease, all in helping us in the diagnosis. Finally, looking at ECG again, if the QRS morphology is typical of a bundle branch block or uh, the baseline ECG shows uh, pre-excitation or uh, evidence of pre-existing bundle branch block, you're always dealing with a supraventric tachycardia. If the QRS morphology is not similar to a typical bundle branch block. You have AV dissociation, you have fusion beats, capture beats, a prominent R in AVR. If you have northwest axis, a narrower QRS during tachycardia than sinus rhythm, combination of right bundle branch block with left axis or left bundle branch block with right axis, a very slow initial depolarization of the ventricle. All these things are very, very specific for me. So to conclude, um, you all know that all arrhythmias will eventually straighten out themselves in the end. And I hope uh, this talk would, uh, would help you in making a difference in this. In, uh, I hope this uh, talk gives you an idea on how to avoid these QRS straightening out in your clinical practice. So that's on from my side. I'll be happy to take on the questions. I hope this uh, talk was useful for you all. And uh, this is one uh, down. And uh, let me just see what are the questions on. Uh, 